Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. Sitting with me here right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Jean Marie R. Brawley. Jean Marie, thanks for being here with me tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be with you. Well, I'm excited to be chatting with you tonight. <laughs> it's really exciting. You have a new book out. It's called Naomi Grace's Wonderful Christmas. Can you tell me about the book? Well, I figured it'd be best probably to just read you the back cover summary because that says all I need to say. Perfect. <laughs> it says, Naomi Grace loves ballet and she loves stories. The year that she is cast as Clara in her ballet school's production of The Nutcracker, she finds herself caught up in a fascinating story off stage when she and her family meet and befriend their mysterious neighbor, Mr. Crabtree. Through this blossoming friendship, Naomi Grace discovers important lessons in compassion, hope, kindness, and wonder, all while celebrating the joy and excitement of ballet and of the Christmas season. Join her as she recounts her marvelous adventure during this wonderful time of the year. Wow, it does sound like a wonderful <laughs> book, absolutely. Jean Marie, what kinds of readers were you writing for for this? You know, I didn't have any particular age group in mind. It is geared for like older children, probably more ages 10 and up. But I would say it's for the young and young at heart, because <laughs> I think smaller, younger children would enjoy having it read to them in sections. And I think adults will enjoy it, too. It's just kind of a feel-good, wholesome story with timeless values that is just kind of a breath of fresh air these days. <laughs> and sounds perfect for the Christmas season, indeed. Yes. So have you ever done anything like this before when it comes to writing a book and being published? This is my first published book. Hmm. I've always enjoyed kind of making up stories and poems and creative writing, but this is the first time I've sent it out into the world as a book. <laughs> Congratulations. It's such Thank a you. big deal. How long did this take you? I initially wrote the story, uh, let's see, towards like the end of 2018 into early 2019 over that holiday season. I was actually recovering from a knee surgery that from an injury that I sustained while doing ballet. <laughs> so I was at home a lot. But I didn't submit the manuscript to Covenant Books until 2020 and then kind of got things rolling more along in 2021. And now we're at the end of 2022. So it's been a few years in the making. So you mentioned yourself doing ballet. So a lot of your personal life has gone into this story. Yes, I would say so for sure. A lot of my personality and my interests are definitely reflected in the protagonist, Naomi Grace's personality and her interests as well. So what was it like when that day finally came, you spent all that time working on this and going through all those publishing hoops, and you got the first hard copy in of Naomi Grace's Wonderful Christmas. What was that like for you? Oh, goodness. It was a special moment. I was sitting with my mom, and I had the box of the author copies that had been sent. I was a little apprehensive because it was like, oh, I'm going to actually see it, you know, in real life, not just over the computer. I hope it's everything I imagined it, and all, you know, all that. And we both loved it immediately. So it was a great moment. <laughs> mm. A lot of people listening want to do that same thing, Jean Marie. They want to write their first book as well. Do you have any advice that you could offer them? Oh, goodness. Well, I'm just a first-time author, so definitely not a seasoned veteran or anything. But I would say be a voracious reader. Read as much as you can, all types of genres of books. Learn proper grammar. I think that's really important. <laughs> And just write, write about what's important to you. And then there are a variety of avenues to publication. So choose, you know, what works for you, works for your life situation, and just go for it. You know, ultimately, if you touch one person or bring them a smile to their face, then it's been worth it. <laughs> well, Jean Marie, have you given any thought to maybe what's next, writing more, publishing more? I would love to do that. Nothing has officially been submitted for publication or anything. I do have another Christmas story that I've written and am considering submitting. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> hmm. I know a lot of people's lives are going to be blessed by this book. It's titled Naomi Grace's Wonderful Christmas. It's written by Jean Marie R. Brawley and is published by Covenant Books. 
Of course, you can find this everywhere, like on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble, on iTunes, and at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Jean-Marie, thank you so much for joining me here at the show tonight. I had a wonderful time talking with you. Thank you for having me. I did, too. Sitting down with me right here now at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Terry Godfrey. Terry, thanks for joining me here tonight. Well, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. You just put out an audio book of your book, Ka Takin. Can you tell me, first of all, about Ka Takin? What's it all about? It's about a group of young adults that leave Central America. Their leader is Erdrich, and he's the third son of a cruel ruler. And they leave, and it's, it's a large band, and they leave Central America around 500, 700 A.D., and they battle their way north to the plains. And once in the plains, they build their own city with a pyramid in the middle, and they line it with gold. Well, where'd you get the idea for this story, Terry? It sounds really imaginative. It's many years ago, I visited Chichen Itza hmm. and did a tour there and was kind of intrigued by it, and I did a little bit other research and reading about the culture. Mm. But I had a really good tour guide that explained a lot of things to us. When you started writing the book, how long of a process was it for you to get it all finished up and then published? It took me about three months to write it. It took about 10 months to get it published through Covenant Books, to get it in print, and then it took about another five months to get the audiobook out. That's fantastic. You did the audiobook version of this. What made you decide to go that route? It had been suggested to me by the publisher, and then I was contacted by them. So we, we checked into it pretty close and went ahead and went that route. I've had a lot of people go and ask me when I do book sales, ask me about audiobooks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's quite a bit of expense in doing that. So I was kind of leery, but I went ahead and tried it this time. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, audiobooks are certainly huge right now. The process of getting that recorded and getting it all together, was that a smooth one for you? Yes, it was. The people that I worked with were amazing. They were really great to work with. Now, Terry, what sorts of readers do you think would really be into the story you're telling in Ka Takin? Well, originally I had thought that it would be a historical fiction, but the publisher suggested going the route of young adults and military. So I will say young males, some females would really go after it, be interested in it. But the youngest one in there in the book is 14, around 14. The oldest is around 30. And like I said, they battle. They they go, you know, on their travels, they go through ter strange territories and different tribes and cultures that they have to fight their way through. But they do make some friends along the way. Mm. Have you thought about more writing in the future, getting more published and maybe more audiobooks? Well, actually, this is one of my later books, last books. I've got 11 books that I've written. Mm. Most of them are self-published. But I've got one of them that's a bestseller that I, if this goes well, I will probably look at doing an audiobook on it. What's the most rewarding part of doing all this for you, Terry? Writing and publishing, putting your work out there for the world. Recognition, but a sense of fulfillment. Hmm. A lot of people listening to us right now are authors who are just starting out. And you've done this a lot, Terry. You've got a lot of experience. What advice could you offer them? Once you complete it, your writing, get a proofreader. Mm. It doesn't have to be someone professional. I used my mother, which is a retired school teacher, to do the original first proofread. Once you get it proofread, check it. Make sure you want to make those changes. Once you do that, read through it yourself again, and then you're going to find some mistakes that you want to correct. Mm. Do that and then get an editor and have it you know, semi or professionally edited. Very wise. Well, it happens to most of us, and that's writer's block. Terry, do you deal with writer's block sometimes, and then how do you get over it? I, occasionally, but for me, I haven't had much trouble with that. I do have something I'm working on that's going very slow for me. I've kicked some books out in like two weeks, and then this, like I said, this one I did in three months. So I find that that's fairly fast for a majority of writers. I know a lot of listeners right now would really be into this book, and they should check it out. The title is 
Ka Tuck In. It's written by Terry Godfrey and is published by the Audiobook Network. Of course, you can get this at Amazon.com. Terry, thanks again for joining me. I had a really nice time talking with you tonight. I hope we could do this again sometime. Well, I did look forward to it. Of All the Groovy Fish in the Sea. That's the name of the new book. It's in stores right now. The author is Lisa Gonzalez. And Lisa is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. And we get to talk all about it. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's exciting. It is exciting. It's really exciting you have this book out of all the groovy fish in the sea. First of all, I love the title. Can you tell me all about it? The exciting thing about it is I wrote it 20 years ago. Oh, wow. Before I had my first child. Yes, I knew enough to get the manuscript done because once you have children, it's very hard to get anything else done. Mm. So I knew enough to do to get it at least finished. And then I just kind of had it sitting on the shelf and waiting to have it illustrated. And just finally, now that my kids are older, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to get this book published. I've got to get it illustrated and finished. So it's done and it's really exciting that it's all finished and in print. It's a beautiful story about a yellowtail fish. And I got that idea from fishing when I was younger. And one of my most fun times fishing was with catching yellowtails. Hmm. And basically, it's a story about somebody just kind of floating through life and just doing her thing every day and looking for her next adventure. And then she meets someone who gets a hold of her and takes her to a different place. And she finds out that she has a new life. I think that it has a different take on Christianity. As there's a lot of metaphors in it. There's some interesting parts where one of the character actually lies. And so that's where a parent could stop and say, reading it with their child and say, hey, hold on a second. Is she telling the truth? And there's a lot of different areas in the book where parents can stop and kind of talk to their kids about being honest or what's happening in the story, you know, an engaging conversation. And I think basically it's just a wholesome book, which I know a lot of times it's hard to find out there, especially in that age range from five and up even. So I think in that area, it's something that'll be really fun for kids to read, even with their parents. There are lots of good life lessons. <laughs> you mentioned getting it illustrated, and I looked at the cover. I love the cover. I love the artwork and the style in here. So what kind of a process was that? Well, I actually did a watercolor process originally. That cover was something that I drew out and did. That was my idea. And I gave it to Mackenzie Ferry, who was the illustrator. She did it all digitally. And she took the watercolor and basically used the same format with the fish and mm. kind of made the lips a little bigger on Thomas, who's the second character. And she kept Abigail the same and everything the same, just a little different color. So it came out gorgeous. So before this, have you written or published? I've always written poetry. I have a couple other books in the making, sort of that crazy writer, halfway done books. But no, this is my first published book. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. What was it like when that day finally came? You got the first hard copy of All the Groovy Fish in the Sea, and you got to hold this thing after working on it for so long. Yes, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. i um, excited to see it and to hold it and to give it to people, too, to pass them out and mm. see what people think when it first came out. That was exciting, too, to get some feedback from kids that read it. And we, I had people send me some videos and things, and exciting. So when are we going to see a sequel to this, maybe? Have you given any thought to that? Well, when I originally wrote it, it was a poem, was the outline for the story. And the poem is kind of like a Dr. Seuss poem, the rhyming from top to bottom. And then I took that and I made it into the story. So I may end up doing the poem as a book for younger kids. Hmm. So maybe something like that. And then I'm going to start working on my second book. (laughs) So... Yeah, how it ends, there could be a sequel to it, but I'm not sure it needs to be. The ending is the most ex- kind of, it's not an expected end, but it's actually the best part, I think, of the book. Mm. Well, Lisa, I know a lot of people are going to be blessed by this book, and I encourage my listeners to check this out. The title is Of All the Groovy Fish in the Sea. It's written by Lisa Gonzalez, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can find this one everywhere, like at Amazon and at Barnes & Noble, on iTunes and at your local brick-and-mortar stores. Lisa, thanks again for coming by the show and telling me all about of all the groovy fish in the sea. I really had a nice time talking with you. 
Thank you so much. Good to talk to you. Focus. It's the name of the new book. It just hit stores. It's written by Tammy Miller. And Tammy is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we're going to talk all about it. Tammy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Well, it's great to have you here. Can you tell me what readers are in store for with Focus? Right. So it's a faith-based Christian book. It's about a couple of teenage girls that go through life playing basketball. They're huge sports fans, especially love their basketball. And some tragedy strikes the team when they're young, and they are faced with some struggles and some things that we go through, many of us in our lives. And because of that, their faith is tested, and they learn to turn to a couple of the stories in the scriptures. And it takes them on a journey to help them find their faith, to learn to navigate some of life's biggest challenges that we all have right now. So it kind of lets the readers know some of the stories in the scriptures that are my favorite ones, but it takes those stories and puts them in real life situations so that they can learn to be strong and to have strength and to learn through grace how to navigate some of the stuff that we deal with. Hmm. Tammy, who were you writing for? Well, I'm writing primarily for young adults, but it goes all the way up to adults, teenagers, preteens. I've had adults all the way down to, you know, 10 and 12 year olds reading the book right now and I've had great response. So, yeah. So you got to tell me, where did the idea for this story come from? What sparked this? So years ago, I've got four kids, my husband and I, and we have always been a very sports minded household. All of our kids played basketball and my husband coached. And early on when they were younger, you would always worry about things like, what if so-and-so broke their leg or we're heading into the state championship. I hope they don't, you know, have the flu or this doesn't happen. You know, all of these scenarios pop in your mind as a mom, just (laughs) hoping that things don't derail you while you're on your way to this goal. And I just have this huge imagination. So I would always be thinking of all these scenarios. Well, what would we do if this happened? And what could we happen? You know, what would I say? How would I direct my kids to know that they're beyond sports and they're, it's who they are, not as much of what they do that matters. And so it kind of came to life, just different scenarios that happened when they were younger. And then the story just slowly developed and developed and it kind of just went on the back burner and I kept telling my kids and my husband, oh my gosh, I've got this great idea. Like one day when I, you know, get to be a grown up, I'm going to write a book. Mm. And so we, all the kids graduated, we're, you know, empty nesters. And my husband has known that I've just had this in the back of my mind. And he sat me down and said, let's just put it down on paper so that one day, even your kids or your grandkids have a chance to read it. And he'd never really read it. He kind of just heard about it. So I wrote it down on paper, got it out on my little computer, and we we're on the road headed out to the beach. And he said, well, let me read this. And so over the next week or so, he read it and was just blown away. He's like, this story just needs to be out there. This is like a really cool way to read the scriptures through some of the stories. In particular, this is the story about Peter and how he's asked to walk on water and about how when life struggles and waves and everything like that else pops up he loses his focus on what's really important. And so it kind of goes through that lesson in the book. Anyway, so he talked me into publishing it. So I published it and it just kind of rolled from there. So Tammy, this is your first book. Did it take you a long time to write and put through the publishing process? Once I actually sat down and did the publishing process, it was about a year, about a year ago right now to get to this point. I think there was a lot of things that we will do differently next time. I do have another book that I finished that I'm ready to send in the publisher right now. And I think there's a lot of things I know beforehand now where there was just a lot of questions, but it went pretty smooth. It really did. I know a lot of readers are going to be touched and inspired by this book and not to check it out. The title is Focus. It's written by Tammy Miller, and it's published by Covenant Books. You can pick it up everywhere, of course, like at Amazon and Barnes and Noble iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Tammy, thank you so much again here for joining me tonight. I had a wonderful time chatting with you. I appreciate it, Corey. Thank you so much. Beautifully Broken 
is the new book. It's out in stores right now, written by Anne Michael. I'm really happy that Anne is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to chat all about it. Anne, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'd really love to hear about Beautifully Broken. What can readers expect? Beautifully Broken is kind of a survival story, if you will. I lost my husband to suicide. and oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I searched everywhere for something Christian-based to help me with the suicide part of my grieving. And it, I really couldn't find anything that was answering the questions that I wanted answered. So I ended up writing it. It actually is a story of my journey from the day that my husband died. Certainly, there's no 100% healing with a suicide, mm. but to the point that I could actually say that life is going to go on and that I could understand it a little bit better and I could find some forgiveness in the entire process. Mm. Now, when you're writing something like this, I could imagine it's really tough and might have taken you a long time. Was that the case? It did. It took me about a year from the time I put the first word to paper to when I felt like it was done. I kept feeling like when I read it now, I don't think it's done. I think there's additional chapters that could be written and added to the book because it's an ever-evolving process to survive suicide of a loved one. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's going to keep going, but it did take me just about a year to finish the book as it is now. What's your writing background look like? Have you ever done anything like this before? I have never done anything like this before. I actually have a degree in journalism and communication, but I've never used it professionally. I have written children's stories for my grandchildren, but they're the only ones that have eyes on it. I've never published anything other than like news articles and so forth when I was in college, but nothing like this at all. What was it like when you got that first hard copy in of Beautifully Broken? You got to hold it, look at it for the first time. Must have been special. It was extremely special. It was surreal. I cried a lot. It was even more than holding the book for the first time was when I read it in its completed version. It was an unbelievable experience to read it in my own words and my journey on paper. It was an amazing feeling to read that. Mm. So you said that there might be more to tell about this story. Were you thinking of maybe in the future doing an updated edition or maybe writing another book altogether? I'm actually working on a novel. Hmm. Beautifully Broken is not written in novel form. It's, I don't like to call it a self-help book. I like to think that there's hope in the pages hmm. of Beautifully Broken. I feel like when you lose someone anyway, there's darkness. And with suicide, I think that there's so many missing pieces. You'll never actually have what they call closure. There's a chapter in the book actually titled The Unclosure, because I don't think there's such a thing. But I think that on the pages of Beautifully Broken, there's a lot of hope. And my book that I'm working on now is a novel, and it's a fictionalized interpretation of real-life events. It is actually Anne Michael's life story. Because what they read in what my readers are getting from Beautifully Broken is just that one chapter of my life. And there's so much more. And I've had a lot of people want to get to know Anne Michael a little bit more after reading Beautifully Broken. So that's what I'm doing. Hmm. A lot of people listening to us right now, Anne, are people, authors who are just getting started. Do you have any advice that you could offer them? Don't give up. Everybody's got a story. If you want to put your story to paper, write it with your heart and don't give up. Just believe in yourself because I honestly would have never believed that I would be able to do something like this. There's a very, very real part of me that is sad that it took the death of my husband for me to do it. But I believe as a Christian that God has taken this horrible experience in my family's life and turned it into something that can help others. Mm -hmm. I believe that that's what we're supposed to do. I believe that's what Beautifully Broken represents. Well, Anne, I know you're helping so many people with your story in this book. It's titled Beautifully Broken. It's written by Anne Michael and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can find it everywhere, of course, like at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes in traditional brick-and-mortar stores. And thank you again for joining me tonight and telling me all about Beautifully Broken and your story. I hope we get to talk again sometime. I hope so, too. I appreciate your time. Thank you. The Family Child Support Conspiracy 
This is the name of the new book. It just hit stores. It's written by J.C. Street, and he's right here with me now to chat all about it. J.C., welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me today. Well, it's my pleasure. Can you tell me what readers can expect with the Family Child Support Conspiracy? Well, this book is basically about how Congress injected a stimulus response theory into our family court system, which advertently impacted our social cultural society, doubling our divorce rates, creating uncertainty about our children's paternity, and empowering our worst and private states to misuse tens of millions of dollars in child support payments. What kinds of readers were you reaching out to with this book, JC? Well, hopefully Christians and definitely Christian leadership community, mm. pastors, elders, clergymen, those who counsel families that are in crisis. Hmm. And what sparked you to sit down and start writing this book? What inspired you to do this? A few things. My siblings also inspired me to do it. And this is a desire to let people know what was in this system and to help families through their crisis. In your opinion, JC, why aren't things like this discussed? They're such important issues. They seem to be swept under the carpet. Yeah, because it's taboo. I've been in the system both as a custodial parent and a non-custodial parent. So I know both sides of it. For those who are in the system as a non-custodial parent, all the guns are basically pointing at you. So what's happening is you're being shamed. The general public believes that over 90% of families or males, most of the time, custodial parents do not pay child support. And the fact is only 6% don't pay. Hmm. So it's, not, it's something in the church, especially the clergyman, we all believe that you should pay your child support. I mean, that's just the basic thing you should do for your child. You brought them here, you take care of them. Hmm. But that's not the issue. The issue is, is that no one's talking about it because they're too embarrassed to admit they're part of the system. And in both sides, the male and the female. So as you read the book and you go through these different scenarios, if you're in the system, you see yourself. And unfortunately, sometimes people are at a point where they participated but did not realize the consequences of their participation. Because this thing filters down for generations and generations and generations. And the only thing it really does is keeps us in poverty. For your family members, you, you should want the better for your, your children as you have for yourself. That's the same for me and my family. This is really something that's slightly different. I've heard a person, a bishop, make a statement over the pulpit years ago. And I said to myself, does this person really understand what they just said? And if they had the opportunity to read this book, they would be surprised how much they would change their answer about that. Because it's not about a person's paying their child support, but it is about the amount of money that this system is generating. Mm. It's crazy. Texas alone, two years ago, generated billions of dollars, the highest amount of money collected in child support history in the pandemic. This book explains how they did it and that they continue to keep doing it, and other states are starting to follow it. At the same time, the disparity with those who are in the system is widening. Why? Because the money is not going to the children. The money is going to the state that the children are living in. So it's phenomenal. So the more information you get about it, the easier it becomes to say, hey, this is not something for me. There must be an alternative. And the last thing you want to do is go to a person who's supposed to offer you guidance, like in a church, Christian society, and you go before your pastors, your elders, and you, know, you and your, your spouse, and say, we, we have this financial issue problem, what should happen? For them to give you misguided information. So I think they should read the book and become the spark of an information. And this way, when, when they, they, they still might say the same thing. They might say, yeah, you still should go to the system. That's fine. And that's what they say. But I can't guarantee anything. 99% once you read it, you're going to say, no way do I want my family to be a part of the system. Period. So if I, if I can get that done, I feel very confident that once they read it, because in the back of the book, it has all the statistical data from everything that I say stated, the resources guide, it gives you exactly where to go to get the answer from the government, not from me, mm. from the government on their websites. And it's pretty astonishing that the information is out there. But as I say, if you ever want to hide something from a person, put it in the book. So hopefully we can reverse that trend and get people to read this book and, and get the help that we need. Absolutely. Well, this book tackles some really important issues, and I encourage my listeners to check it out. It's titled The Family Child Support Conspiracy. This is written by J.C. Street and is published by Covenant Books. You can find it everywhere, like on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. J.C., thank you again for joining me here tonight and telling me all about your really important work. I had a nice time talking with you. Thank you. Veridesian Tales, The Hidden Woodlands. It's the name of the new book. It's co-authored by Lori Raven and Alexis Cantor, and I'm really happy to be talking with Lori right here now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. 
Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Oh, well, hi. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be doing this this evening. Well, the pleasure is all mine, Lori. Can you tell me all about Veridesian Tales? Oh, yeah, I sure can. <laughs> and I will insert some things that my co-author, my granddaughter, I'll refer to her probably as Lexi throughout from our conversation. She's coached me on some thoughts she wants me to share, so I'll have some of her things inserted there, too. Wonderful. Basically, our story opens a door to a breathtaking, magical woodland with many forest creatures, abundant plant life, all of whom have some remarkable adaptations they've made because of this special environment. And we also have some organic magic going on in our story. Our story starts with Cat at 10 years old, and she's alone now, having been left when she, after her sixth birthday by her parents to do the job of guardian over the Veridesian forest that she's living in. She's living in a high-tech treehouse right in the heart of the forest, and it's her inherited responsibility to take care of the forest, its well-being, and all the creatures who live within it. She has to do all this by herself, along with the animals that, that live with her. The life is peaceful, harmonious. The days pass very happily for Kat and her animal friends as she does this job. But, you know, we know there's nothing as certain as change in this world, and it's no different for Viridesia. And when the regular world around them, including some unusual young people, start entering her forest, Kat finds herself struggling to balance the responsibility she has with her need to interact with other people her age, which she's never had a chance to do. And maybe, maybe she'll have some friends for the first time in her life. She does have to deal with some threatening challenges, and she has to deal with them in a nonviolent manner because they're committed to that in Veridesia and all of the lands that have Veridesians living there. She has to protect the secrecy and the well-being of her woods and all the creatures who live in there. And you know, just like for all of us, the teenage years are a time in life that's filled with roller coaster emotions, physical changes, mm -hmm. and self-discovery. And, you know, Kat does not get a hall pass on that stuff, so to speak. From this stage of life, she has to cope with everything that every teenager in, and pre-teenager in our world today has to cope with. She has to do all that, and she's still responsible for protecting that hidden world, keeping it secret, and keeping everyone there safe. Well, Lori, you got to tell me, how did the idea for this come about? I just love how imaginative and creative it is. Well, I'm glad you asked that, because it, it came about when my granddaughter, Lexi, was, who's also my co-author, was three and a half years old. We started changing the pretend role-playing games that she liked to do. It started out with the whole Hello Kitty thing. And then when she hit three and a half, she decided she wanted to be a woodland girl and decided that her name was going to be Cat and it was going to be magical. I got to be Emma, who's also one of our characters, who was appearing to be a regular human around her same age. And as Lexi grew up, the plots of all these pretend plays that we would play probably one or two times a week, these plots became more intricate and more sophisticated as she matured. And we actually played these evolving versions of the Woodland Girl over more than five years. But in, in every play, she was Kat, I was Emma, she lived in a treehouse, and there were magical, incredibly gifted animals surrounding us. I'm grown up and I'm thinking, why am I still having so much fun playing these games? <laughs> you know, I really liked it. Mm. Not just because of the escape to the magic, to the fun, and the quality time I'm playing and spending with my granddaughter, but there were some messages in there that, that we were sharing as well about nonviolence, about mm. taking care of each other, about being compassionate. And all of these ideas made it really fun. And then I asked her, you know, maybe we should share these stories because they are so much fun. She's always loved to read and write since the time she was about two and a half. So I really shouldn't have been surprised when she says, okay, let's write a book. Mm. And I said, <laughs> okay, let, let's do that. Then we started writing. Well, I know readers are really going to love this book, and I encourage them to check it out. The title is Veridesian Tales, The Hidden Woodlands. It's written by Lori Raven and Alexis Cantor, and it's published by Fulton Books. You can grab this one up everywhere, like at Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and Google Play and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Lori, thank you so much again for joining me here tonight and telling me all about this wonderful book. I hope you can talk again for the next one. Thank you, Corey. Thank you so much for the time and listening to our little endeavor <laughs> with the book. I really appreciate it. When a soul becomes human... It's a new book. It just hit stores. It's written by LJC. 
The author, Corey, is right here with me now at the show, and we're going to chat all about it. Corey, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. It's great to be here, Corey. Well, it's great to be talking with you. Corey, can you tell me all about when a soul becomes human? What can readers expect? So when a soul becomes human is a, an adventure story that introduces from my life experiences and research that I've conducted insight into the universe that we exist within where I wanted to be playful in challenging the limited notions of science and the stern beliefs of religion and tie that together with a adventure story of one soul's introduction to Earth and the universe as I've learned it. Hmm. What sorts of readers do you think would be really into this? I hope that teenagers and adults alike would be interested, but anyone willing to stretch their imagination and just see how much is out there in the universe that we may or may not be aware of, I think would find it interesting. How did the idea come about for When a Soul Becomes Human? This was an idea that I had as a teenager that I wrote down in a piece of paper some long time ago that I knew that I wanted to write about at a later time when I was in a position at which I could really have fun and explore these concepts. Mm. And so that draw back then till now led me to getting into a position where I was able to really dive into this as an author. And it was just good timing. Mm. Now, before this, before When a Soul Becomes Human, had you written or published? I have not. Mm, congratulations. Getting that first book out there is quite a big deal, and I'm sure you learned a lot along the way. So, Corey, do you have any advice that you could give to the aspiring authors who are listening to us right now? I think if I really had to consider the best piece of advice that I could offer is that when you're looking to publish a book, don't overthink it. Just Run with it and get it going, and you'll find that in a lot of times it'll take a life of its own. And once you get in that groove, you just go with it. Did writing this take you a long time, being your first book? So I started it roughly around 2018. COVID and, and life events put me in a position where I didn't feel as excited and happy to write. So that prolonged it a little bit into 2020 to 2021. And so it took about two and a half years to actually get it published once I started writing. And after all that time, once you got the first hard copy in of this and got to hold it and look at this thing that you've been working on for so long, Corey, what was that moment like for you? A lot of nervousness, excitement, kind of giddy. Definitely did a little bit of dancing. <laughs> and what are the chances that we'll be seeing more from you in the future when it comes to writing and publishing? Definitely loved it. And I already have two additional books that I'm working on. Hmm. Not in tandem, but I have started them, and I enjoyed the process very much, and I would love to continue it. It definitely can be a process that's really enjoyable, but it's not always easy. Sometimes you can hit some roadblocks, like maybe writer's block, or maybe you just don't have the ideas anymore. Did you ever hit any of those challenges? I did. There were a couple of times, especially between 2020 and 2021, that everything, everybody in life were dealing with their personal challenges. And at times I had to take a step back and just give it space. Mm. And at other times I had to write it up on the wall and really try to visualize it and act out what I was trying to get to, to actually be able to put pen to paper. Corey, who are the people in your life who inspire you and maybe motivate and encourage you? My wife, first and foremost, she has been a big advocate for me doing this. And my family back home in Michigan, I'm in Arizona, originally from Michigan. And when they heard that I was getting ready to be published and I wanted to write this book, they were definitely advocates for me sticking to it and getting it done. Did you have a routine when you were writing? Are you like an early morning writer or a late night writer? Or did you just write when you found that the time and ideas were available? Since it was my first time, I, I tried a little bit of everything. I would have to say that the thing that worked best for me once I got through all the things that didn't work <laughs> was that when I felt like writing, I had to really tell myself, you need to go write versus trying to structure it. I found when I did that, I, I really limited my output. Mm. I really think a lot of readers are going to get a lot out of this book. The title is When a Soul Becomes Human. It's written by LJC and is published by Fulton Books. You can pick it up everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Google Play, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Corey, thank you again for stopping by the show and telling me all about when a soul becomes human. I had a nice time chatting with you. It was my pleasure. This next book looks to transform and heal readers. It's called The King's Daughter, Divinely Orchestrated. It's written by Michelle Davidson, and I'm really happy that Michelle is joining me here right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. We get to talk all about it. 
Michelle, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure. Well, the pleasure's all mine. Michelle, can you tell me all about The King's Daughter? What can readers expect here? Well, I will say to you that this book was truly inspired by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't my desire to sincerely write a book, but I realized through my own journey of not knowing and understanding just what the power of salvation did for my life and just the authority I walk in. And so I used this platform to share my journey, to share failures and triumphs, and at the end, understanding just what the power of God's grace, His love, and salvation can do in the life of any believer. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what kinds of readers do you think would get the most out of The King's Daughter? I think a lot of readers that may have been struggling in different areas of their lives, desiring more, wanting to go deeper in their walk with the Lord, would find that this book will really ignite and rekindle probably a flame that needs to be inflamed in their own personal journey and inspire them to do whatever is possible with the Lord. So I think the reader at first, I thought it was women, but I'm finding so many men are enjoying the contents of this book. I think it's pushing both younger and older readers to just maximize life and the potential in Christ. Hmm. Michelle, what was that spark that made you say, hey, I got to sit down and start writing this book. I want to get this thing published. Well, the thing is, is I never thought of myself as a writer. I had a bunch of friends that said to me, the stories that you're sharing with me intimately, the world needs to hear it. Mm. They need to hear how someone like yourself who was told you would never have children or, you know, come from areas where you were so impoverished and never thought, you know, the basic needs that we have could be met. And then to be in a place of overflow. So just for people that watch my life to just see what God did and how he elevated me through faith. They encouraged me to share my journey, share my story, and ultimately I just honored the voice of the Lord that told me to go ahead and, and do this project. Hmm. Michelle, I could imagine that writing something like this would have taken you a long time. Was that the case? It took me living it out for 20 years. It took me two months to write the book. Hmm. <laughs> so I lived this. I lived every page. So I poured my heart out in this book. I was just very honest and very intimate with the readers. So it took 20 years of my journey to be able to get to a place to write down and document my memoir, but it really did took about two to three months to finish the full draft of the book. And when it came to actually getting it published, what was the most challenging part about that whole process for you? So when I wrote the book, I wasn't really sure where it was headed. I wasn't sure if I would be published, if I would self-publish the book. It's a very interesting story. My husband and I was watching the Super Bowl 2021, this first, the beginning of this year, January, actually, of 2022, and Christian Faith Publishing happened to just come across the screen on an ad, and he said, I feel good about this company. Why don't you mm. send them your manuscript? And within a week or two, I went from not sure what would happen with the contents of my manuscript to being, you know, signed by Christian Faith to produce this book. What was it like when you got that first physical copy and you get to hold your book for the first time? Coming from where I come from, from all I've been through, it was just really overwhelming to see what God was able to do in my life and what he could do with obedience. Because when it comes down to it, if I didn't obey and answer the call to write the book and to do the project, the moment I held the book would never have been reality. So just to know that you can honor God with your life and obey his call his instructions, and he can glorify himself in the work that is produced and the outcomes. So it was just awesome. It was just an awesome moment for me and my family because we've walked this journey together. Michelle, do you think you'll be doing more writing, more publishing in the future? I have two more books <laughs> <laughs> that I'm inspired to write, one for married couples and other one that will really speak to raising children. I know a lot of lives are going to be touched by this book. It's titled The King's Daughter divinely orchestrated. It's written by Michelle Davidson, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can find this one everywhere, of course, like at Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, on iTunes, and at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Michelle, it's been wonderful speaking with you here tonight and learning all about The King's Daughter and everything that you got coming up. Thanks again for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, and have an amazing rest of your day. The Resurrection of Matthew. It's a new book. It just hit store shelves, and it's written by Thomas Jerky, 
Thomas is right here, and we're going to chat all about it. Thomas, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Well, it's my pleasure. Thomas, can you tell me what readers are in store for with The Resurrection of Matthew? Well, The Resurrection of Matthew is the story of a young man in his early 30s who is enjoying the, quote, good life, but he's finding his happiness through alcohol and drugs and relationships with women. As he goes on through his process of living, uh, things tend to get darker and darker and more serious as far as his addictions are concerned and starting to affect his ability to really enjoy his life and be productive. The book tells his story initially of the darkness that he goes through, and then he has some warnings that he comes across in the process of living his daily life that makes him realize that he is out of control and he needs help, but he doesn't know how to get that help. And he has never had God in his life. He uh, has never wanted God in his life. Through different circumstances and people that he meets, he finally finds some avenues to try to seek help and does find some improvement, but the real issue is is that he's going he's going to need a miracle in his life to be able to pull out of his darkness. And the question is, will that miracle come his way, and if so, by what form? To find the answer, you have to read the book. Mm. Thomas, to me, uh, I think this is a lifestyle, maybe a situation that so many people find themselves in nowadays. But I think this is great that you've written it. And I assume that there's a beacon of hope at the end of all this. There is. Yes, there is definitely a beacon of hope. And for the ladies out there, there's a little, some nice romance in the book. And the story definitely takes a turn. But of course, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Thomas, where did the idea for this story come from? That's an interesting story in itself. I had written three previous books, which were autobiographical, and then I decided I wanted to write a novel. And so I sat down with pencil and pad and uh, came up with absolutely nothing and uh, became very frustrated. Matter of fact, I was about to give it up. And this actually happened one night in my deep sleep. I suddenly found myself wide awake sitting up in bed. And it was like this story was playing out in front of me of what this novel, what the book should be. Hmm. And the next morning I got up and I got my pad and pencil and said a prayer for the Lord to guide me through the story and what he wanted me to say. And I just started writing and basically didn't stop until it was finished. Yeah, it sounds like it was just meant to be. It was just a story that needed to be told. I believe that very sincerely, and I believe that the story was given to me. I didn't really create it myself, in a sense. <laughs> mm. And Thomas, you're an experienced author. What advice would you have to those listening who aren't as experienced, don't even have a book out there at all yet? Well, I think, you know, the first advice is, is come up with a story you want to tell. And that can take many different styles, types, uh, you know, it can be, again, autobiographical, as my first books were, or it can be a children's story, whatever it is, but come up with a story and put pen in hand and just sit down and start writing the story and just developing what it is you want to communicate to people. And the most important thing is, is stick with it and get support. I think that's very important. I've, I have several readers that I, friends that I call upon to help me as I go through the process with my book. And that's very important to get feedback and, and suggestions from others. Absolutely. There's nothing like being able to hold the product of all your efforts. Thomas, what was it like for you whenever you get that first hard copy in and you get to hold it and look at that thing that you spent all that time and effort to create? Well, it's a wonderful feeling, and of course, the main thing is that you know a feeling of accomplishment, mm. and uh, that your efforts have paid off. You know, and then being able to to share it with with readers, with people, is just you know, it's a great feeling of accomplishment. Mm. Well, I know a lot of people are really going to be into this novel. I encourage my listeners to check it out. The title is "The Resurrection of Matthew." It's written by Thomas Jerky. It's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Pick this one up everywhere, like on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and iTunes and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Thomas, thank you again for joining me here tonight and telling me all about the resurrection of Matthew and everything you got coming up. I hope we get to talk again soon. I hope so, too. Thank you, Corey. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. 
We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. Or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.